Welcome and thank you for joining part two of SciFarth's micro webinar series, Jury Trials in 2024, SciFarth's Employment Trial Team on Lessons from the Frontlines. All participants are in listen only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program through the Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. Any unanswered questions will be followed up by email after the webinar. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Rob Fisher. Rob, you may begin. Thank you, Brooke. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Fisher. I am a labor and employment partner in the Boston office here at SciFarth, uh, and I'm thrilled to be with my friend and partner, Molly Mooney. Uh, both Molly and I handle uh, single plaintiff litigation uh, in the employment sphere, and um, we had the privilege of doing a couple of jury trials last year together. So, um, but today we're talking not about trials themselves, but about the lead up to trials. And the genesis of this program was, uh, for those of you who went to the first, the first program in this session was talking about jury verdicts and how juries operate. And today, you know, we were thinking about how has the discovery process and the lead up to summary judgment and trial changed. And the title, I will admit, of our program is a little hyperbolic, because we're not here to throw out the playbook entirely, but we, but the, the central thesis and what we're going to talk about today is the way in which plaintiffs and courts think about these cases is such that um, we are finding ourselves more and more thinking about discovery from a trial perspective, not for a summary judgment perspective. Uh, and, and I'm going to do a little bit of a compare and contrast, and the uh, because I guess because I'm older, Molly has asked me to, to talk about the old way. I'm kidding. Uh, next slide, please. I did not say that. <laughs> All right, fair enough. That was me making a joke. Um, and by the old way, I'm, so I've been practicing about 25 years, and when I started as a junior associate handling these cases. The, the fundamental goal of the litigation was to create a record through discovery that would then lead, lead to a winning summary judgment motion. Uh, and the example in the slide, I think, sort of captures the, the approach, which was when I was drafting the deposition outline of the plaintiff for the partner on the case, we would carefully craft very specific questions that were designed to get the yes answer from the plaintiff so that when we drafted that summary judgment motion, we could pull out that testimony and say, the plaintiff said yes to this, this, and this, and based upon that, you should grant us summary judgment. And, and I don't wanna say that was the entirety of the focus, but that was effectively the strategy. And a lot of that was driven by the framework that I think many of you already know, which is referred to as the McDonnell Douglas Burdine burden shifting analysis. And essentially, this is something that's been adopted both by federal courts and as well as state courts, this idea of how do you decide where there's no direct evidence of discrimination, issues of motive, primarily on summary judgment. And, and the three step process is first, the plaintiff has the burden of showing, and this is a relatively low threshold, a prima facie case. The employer then has the burden of presenting some evidence of a legitimate non-discriminatory reasons for its actions. And then the plaintiff then has to present evidence that the, the reason given is not is not the real reason, i.e. pretext. And so oftentimes on summary judgment, you'd say, oh, we concede that the plaintiff meets the prima facie case, but the argument would effectively be that the plaintiff couldn't demonstrate that the employer's reason wasn't a true reason, can't prove pretext. And, and the whole point of it was to sort of focus in on that and get a court to say, we'll grant summary judgment on that basis. And, and I'm not here to say that that strategy isn't viable. And I'm not here to say, don't, don't file a summary judgment motion on that basis. Um, the, that framework is still the law. Uh, in general, we'll talk a little bit about how it's changed. Uh, but um, what we've seen is that the way in which courts are thinking about these issues and thinking about how do you sort out the evidence as to motive um, 
it, it's a softening of the approach and, and, I, and to sort of give some, some um, meat to the argument, Molly is gonna walk us through some data. So next slide. So as you can see here, we have collected data in federal cases spanning for about the last 15 years. And for the majority of that time period, the rates were pretty static. So around 44 to 45% of cases would survive summary judgment, meaning some portion of the case, whether summary judgment was denied in full or partially granted, some cases, some claims on a case survived summary judgment. But what you can see is that in the last couple years, which are really the post pandemic years, more cases are surviving summary judgment. And while the federal data doesn't seem that stark, or, you know, a three to 4% um, difference doesn't seem huge. We really are seeing quite a big difference in cases surviving summary judgment at the state level. Um, so it, it causes us to ask what's, what's causing this? Why are more cases surviving summary judgment? And there's a few possible explanations, but ultimately it's, it's kind of hard to know. Um, but the first of those is that there's been a lot of delays in courts since COVID. It, that's starting to clear up, but especially here in Massachusetts, I'm sure it's similar in other states, we've had cases sitting for years. So Rob mentioned that we had a jury trial last year, and that was a trial in 20, uh, 2023 relating to events that happened in 2015. So years and years are going by um, and courts are overloaded. And so they're sort of kicking out trial dates far into the future um, in primarily hopes that maybe those cases will settle because statistically a lot of cases do settle before trial. There's also some case law specifically in Massachusetts suggesting that summary judgment in the employment context is disfavored. Um, and that's really based on this assumption that these decisions in these types of cases, discrimination and harassment involve motive. And so the thought process is, let's just let this go to trial. Let's see what these folks have to say. Let's let the jury decide when it comes to motive. And of course, that thought process fails to take into account that the McDonnell Douglas burden shifting framework that Rob just talked about already takes motive into consideration. But nonetheless, there is this tendency for some courts to really just sort of punt on the issue and let the case go to trial. Finally, one more possible explanation is that the plaintiff's bar has just gotten more savvy. So we've seen a lot more artful pleading from plaintiff's lawyers. So especially in the last couple of years, um, we've been seeing a lot of very long and detailed complaints, like 30 to 60 pages long. Um, and so they're also not preparing the plaintiff in the case on every single document when it comes time for their deposition so that ultimately when you're deposing a plaintiff, they're sort of just telling their story and it's really hard to pin them down on specific documents because they haven't been prepared to, to, de to be deposed on those documents. And so um, it leaves this opening for disputes of fact. Can I just jump in Molly on that point? Um, what we see when we get to the deposition of the plaintiff, when you ask them what they do to prepare for deposition, they typically say they've read two documents, the complaint, which obviously isn't evidence, and then their answers to interrogatories. And it's hard for me not to think it's a strategy by the plaintiff's bar to have the plaintiff know only sort of the raw allegations and their sort of compiling of what they view as the evidence in their story. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so they're coming into their deposition ready to tell that same story that's been very artfully pled in their complaint by their lawyers. And, and that has an impact on the admissions that you're getting in the deposition and ultimately whether or not there's going to be disputes of fact remaining for summary judgment. And then finally, one more, one more thing that is this has been going on for a number of years now, but it's really, it's really gotten quite difficult in the past few years is that everything in these cases now is so document intensive. So we're using 
email, we're using Slack, Teams messages. There's just communication about everything. And so oftentimes the summary judgment record before the court is so vast and hard to sift through that it's oftentimes easier for the court to say, look at all this, look at all these communications. There has, there's a dispute of fact here, there has to be. Um, so those are some possible explanations for this shift. But nonetheless, it's a shift that we've certainly seen, especially within the last few years since COVID. So now we can go to the next slide. So why are we talking about this? So ultimately, we're seeing obviously more cases surviving summary judgment, but we're also now living in this new era of explosive verdicts. And by explosive verdicts, we mean verdicts in cases that are over 10 million, $25 million. And if anyone joined for part one of this webinar series, um, we had a whole discussion on explosive verdicts and sort of what's causing them. Um, and so it's just something that employers need to be aware of because it's certainly impacting cases and how they go to trial. And it should be impacting how counsel are preparing these cases to go to trial. And now we can go to the next slide. So, so given that background, um, what Molly and I um, are seeing and thinking about in terms of, so we get a new case and we're thinking about how we proceed with the case. We're thinking at a fairly early stage about what does this case look like at trial? Uh, and because on the assumption that if you just take the data from the federal courts, one out of two cases is gonna, is gonna survive summary judgment, assuming it doesn't settle. Uh, and we're thinking about how to avoid that that giant explosive jury verdict. So and and so from our perspective, that really happens early on in the case, and that discovery needs to be focused not just on how do we get to summary judgment, but also how do we get ourselves ready for trial. And I'm going to start at what will seem like a weird place. Um, uh, can you advance two slides, please? which is jury instructions. And probably all of you know what jury instructions are. These are essentially each party's recommendations to the judge as to what the law, what the jury should be told the law is before they decide the case. And jury instructions are typically filed within a couple of weeks or even days before the trial is started. And during the trial, there's some back and forth between the judge and the parties as to what the jury instructions look like. Uh, I have a different view of jury instructions, which is, I think they are the roadmap for what your case is going to look like through discovery. And so while it may feel strange to be thinking about jury instructions at the outset of a case, um, and I'm not talking about a fixed document, but the idea of thinking through what are the elements that the plaintiff has to prove in his or her case? What are the elements of whatever defenses you intend to prove as part of your defense of the action? And, and beginning to sort of build out what those what that law framework looks like, because that's going to help sh help decide what the discovery is going to look like. And so while it does feel weird to be talking about jury instructions for a case that's just starting and you're just starting starting the discovery process, it's an important way to be thinking about it strategically about what is this case going to look like at trial? What evidence do we need to prove to show not just the case for why there's no dispute of fact of summary judgment, but why the damages are speculative, for example, or why the hundreds of thousands of emotional distress damages are unreasonable. So those are the kinds of things that we want to think about as we begin the discovery process. And oftentimes this becomes the framework for, for summary judgment too, but it, it really helped, but ultimately it's helping you think through what you need to discover you need for discovery if and when if this case does go to trial. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about written discovery um, and specifically about privilege. And, and it's obviously really hard to talk about written discovery, like document requests, and interrogatories in the context in the abstract. And so I mean I, I don't I generally don't use cookie cutter requests. Every case I think warrants its own set of requests to the plaintiff both for documents and interrogatories. I'm not gonna really talk about that. I'm gonna talk about a different issue, which I think goes to the discovery, the written discovery process 
which is privilege. Um, obviously, employers, and any party, frankly, has the right to use privilege to withhold from discovery communications with counsel regarding legal advice, as well as work product. The, what we are seeing at trial is the plaintiff's bar is being very savvy to suggest that the use of privilege by the employer with to withhold information um, is somehow suspicious and to give the jury the impression that something is being withheld from them, that they're not getting the complete story and who's to blame the defendant that, that blacked out a large section of the document due to privilege. And, 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 and obviously the judge can charge the jury and say, look, employer defendants have the right to obtain legal advice and that's privilege from discovery. Um, but the bottom line is juries don't like the redactions. They don't like seeing this blacked out information and no, no, no amount of charge from the jury is gonna solve that problem. Uh, and, and so, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't assert privilege. You absolutely should. And I'm not suggesting you should waive privilege without a lot of consideration. As probably many of you know, if you waive the privilege, the scope of that waiver can be broader than any particular document. Um, but where this circles back into written discovery is the realities of, of electronic discovery and email. So, for example, there's a series of emails between the manager and the employee who ultimately sues the company. And then that email, that whole chain gets forwarded to in-house counsel. What that email ends up looking like when it gets produced is the emails between the manager and the employee plaintiff, and then the final email in the chain blacked out. And, and so one of the things I really emphasize is thinking about how that's going to look at trial. And so if you've got email chains that look like that, I want to make sure there's a version that ends right before it goes to the lawyer. And so that I can say, when the plaintiff wants to put in that blacked out version, I can say, no, 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 that's gonna be, that's gonna be confusing to the jury. Here's the chain up to the point where it's privileged. And so it's not typically how we think about written discovery and producing email because the whole goal of the email process is efficiency, trying to cut down the amount of documents we're reviewing. But whenever you have redactions, I strongly recommend that you look carefully at the underlying documents to make sure you're producing a version that doesn't have the privileged communication on it. And this is a, and particularly important with email um, because what's happening is those redactions, which you have every right to do and is an appropriate part of the discovery process is just being used to sort of play on jury's conspiracy theories. So Rob, I'll jump, I'll jump yeah, in there really quickly. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I just want to note again. So in part one of this series, we had a jury consultant, Claire Luna, join the panel to sort of talk about trends that um, she was seeing from different jury um, pools and um, things that they had put together. And one of the consistent and common themes was that jurors now are more likely to distrust corporations, distrust employers, and more likely to believe conspiracy theories. So this sort of plays into that, where if there are a ton of documents in a case that have redactions, then the plaintiff's bar is going to focus on that and they're going to say, you know, what are they trying to hide? And the jurors will sort of believe that, like they don't know what's behind the redaction and they may assume the worst. So to the, these are just issues that you should be thinking about as you're preparing those types of exhibits for trial. And, and on that issue, um, it's not helped by news reports and it's been in the mainstream media. It's not the legal news where uh, of assertions that uh, some, some entities under investigation by the government were using what they were, what was referred to internally as fake privilege, this idea that every time there was a communication that was sensitive, they put a lawyer on it. Not every communication with an in-house lawyer or an external lawyer is privilege. It has to be, has to meet the requirements of attorney-client privilege. And so there is this general suspicion that privilege is being overused. The, la the last thing I'm gonna mention about written discovery is requests for admission. And 
Requests for admissions, for those of you who don't know, are a series of very detailed questions that require the answering party to ad admit or deny. And it's a very specific question. And unlike other written discovery, it allows you to ask questions that are a combination of law and fact, meaning admit that some, some element of the case has been satisfied by one side or the other. The plaintiff's bar historically has, has has used them more than the defense bar. I mean, that's anecdotal, but that's my general sense of things. Um, I, I like RFAs, requests for admission as a defendant, particularly where um, there's a particular issue that you don't want the jury to decide and you wanna have it set in stone that the other side admits that this has been satisfied or this is the answer. Um, now, there's a fair question, well, do juries actually take that into account? Do juries really listen to those admissions? Um, and to make a plug for the next se session in this series, um, I do think the fact that the plaintiff has admitted certain things, and if that's inconsistent with a jury verdict, that's helpful for a potential appeal if there's an adverse verdict. Molly, you wanna talk about depositions? Sure, so we can go to the next slide. So. Other tools in the discovery toolbox, depositions, obviously, top of the list. So the plaintiff's deposition is going to be even more important than it has been in the past. And so, as Rob talked about at the beginning of this presentation, a lot of times counsel is very focused on summary judgment throughout discovery. Um, and that certainly comes through in when you're taking depositions and defending depositions. Um, but the approach now really should be focusing not only on getting admissions for summary judgment, of course, that's still important, but thinking about how you can use these depositions to help frame your case for trial and to help develop themes for trial. It's just something that needs to be thought about as you're going into these depositions. Um, oftentimes, we can get caught up in, in trying to get those really succinct and nice admissions from plaintiffs. Um, with respect to the elements of their claims. Um, but the deposition really needs to be a lot more than that. It's an opportunity to let the plaintiff talk. So I think a lot of lawyers are scared of open-ended questions, but the deposition is the perfect time to do that because ultimately you're going to get the plaintiff's story, whether it's through an affidavit or whether it's through their testimony at trial, and you might as well hear it now. So those open-ended questions are very beneficial so that you can understand what the plaintiff is actually going to say if this case does go to trial. You're also gonna have the opportunity if you're asking those types of questions to get a, a better sense for the plaintiff's demeanor, their credibility, um, and ultimately you can sort of piece together the story that they're going to tell at trial um, to then, come up with what the defense themes will be. And ultimately, for trial, the goal is to make it about the plaintiff. You, whether your plaintiff is sort of misguided, confused, a little wacky, you want to take those faults with your plaintiff and highlight them. And so the deposition is the perfect time to figure those things out. Who is this person and what can we use that they're saying that's going to help us at trial? So one other point about plaintiff's depositions is that it's a little bit more important now to focus on damages because you really wanna get a sense of what the plaintiff is gonna be asking the jury to award them. And obviously a lot of that is in the complaint, but uh, claims sort of morph and damages change throughout the course of litigation. So now more than ever, it's really important to nail down specifically what the plaintiff is going to be asking the jury to award them. And that's even more so the case now when there is this risk for these sort of explosive type of jury verdicts. So pinning that information down sooner is better and helpful for your trial preparation later on in the case. And one other thought we have is that in a case that involves a claim for emotional distress, it can be beneficial to even depose the plaintiff's doctor. So if there's a claim for emotional distress or any other sort of physical injury, um, 
you might want to get a sense of what their doctor, what their medical providers are going to say, what they're like, how they present as witnesses. And oftentimes those types of depositions are overlooked because you don't necessarily need it for summary judgment. Um, but it's such a great opportunity for you to be able to size up what the plaintiff's witnesses at trial will be like. And ultimately, in our experience, those types of witnesses don't like to be deposed. They're busy. They, this is not what they do. They don't want to take time off for a deposition. Nobody likes to be deposed, but it really can give you a leg up um, in terms of getting your head around what the plaintiff's case would look like at trial. Can I just jump in real quick, Molly? Of course. I mean, the, the one thing I'll say is that there's necessarily, you've got to find the balance between getting the, the succinct, clear answer versus hearing what the plaintiff has to say. Um, you know, the when I was trained on how to take depositions, they, 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 I was always told, don't ask one too many questions. Like, when you get the answer you want, move on. But sometimes I think you've got to know from the pleadings and from the plaintiff that you're really not getting the full story. And you've got to ask that extra question, even if it potentially softens that that perfect yes answer that you had. Second, on the damages piece, I think the big there's a there's a really strong reason to focus on damages at deposition, even if it doesn't really matter at that point in time, because it sends a message to the plaintiff's lawyer that the case that they're thinking could be worth a lot might not be worth that much. Um, and you know, I have never seen a case where someone claims emotional distress where they did not have a host of other things going on in their life that were creating the distress that they were alleging to have suffered because of their employment. And so it's an important way, and we'll talk about settlement in a bit, but it's a, it's a perfect way to sort of develop leverage in the overall theme of the case. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, so next slide. So just as the plaintiff's deposition is incredibly important, the depositions of employer witnesses are critical to your case. Um, and this is something that oftentimes, you know, you think about depositions of, of employer witnesses, it's, you know, you're prepping them with doc. Here are the documents that we think you might see, and you're preparing them to be prepared, to be ready to answer questions about those documents. But really, these depositions are so important to be able to tell the story of your case. And so we talked about in part one of this webinar series that jurors just now have more distrust in corporations and more distrust in employers. And part of that is because, you know, it's a it's an entity and there's not a face. And so these depositions of these witnesses, this is the face of, of the employer. These are the people that will be representing you at trial. Um, and oftentimes when we're just sort of going through the motions with depositions, you're not always thinking about that this person is going to be on the stand testifying. And so we need to make sure that what they're saying in their deposition is going to be the story that they're also presenting at trial. So again, in the past, it might have been enough to just sort of prepare a witness with the documents that you think that they're going to see at their deposition. But now you really need to be preparing witnesses to understand the full picture of the case. Um, they need to know what the plaintiff's story is, and they need to know what our story is as the employer. Um, what are our themes? What are What's the story that we want to tell at the end of the day if this case goes to trial? Um, because their deposition is their opportunity to tell the story about their piece in the puzzle and how they contribute to our overall story that we're going to be presenting. One other point that I want to sort of raise about um, that was discussed in part one of this webinar series was that there was a discussion about burdens of proof. So in these types of cases, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to, to prove their claims. But in employment cases, in the in this was I shocking to me. I am sure it'd be shocking to a lot of you. But turns out that jurors don't really care about burdens of proof, um, and that they're really more focused on what feels fair and reasonable. So they're really focused on okay, is what the employer did in this situation with this particular plaintiff fair? Was it reasonable? Did the plaintiff have a chance to correct their performance deficiencies? 
did the plaintiff have fair notice that these things would happen if they didn't do X, Y, or Z? And all of that matters because it's not enough for your witnesses to just get up and say, I sent an email on this date and the plaintiff replied and blah, blah, blah. They need to really tell their story. Like how much did the plaintiff's manager try to help this person? What did they do in terms of performance coaching or what didn't they do? You need to be prepared to have that person tell a story that goes beyond what is shown in the four emails that were sent to the plaintiff about improving their performance. And importantly, you also want your witnesses to be consistent. So at the, at the inception of the case, you should be talking to your witnesses right off the bat. Anyone that you think has knowledge that is potentially going to come up in the course of the case, lock that person in. Have an initial interview with them. Have them tell your story so you understand what this person's knowledge is. You can document it. And then when it comes time for depositions, they'll be prepared. They already know what the case is about. You know what their story is. And then when it comes time for their deposition, they're going to tell their story. And then when it comes time for trial, they're going to tell that same story at trial. All right, next slide. So, so ultimately, from our perspective, the, the goal of discovery, at least from a trial perspective, is to understand what are the themes that you want to develop uh, and working in, with, with internally with the witnesses, in-house counsel, developing what the story at trial is going to be as you understand the facts and as they develop in the record. And, they, and they, one of the challenges with the discovery process, particularly when your own people are being deposed, they may not have a, a full ability to tell their story, and, but it's important to understand how whatever questions they do get asked by the plaintiff's counsel actually fits in with the story and develop that, that, that thematic story that you want to tell a trial where we, you're sending the message to the jury that, hey, we're the ones that tried to do everything for the plaintiff to make sure this didn't happen. This is the person who's being a little wacky or read everything in a way, in a twisted way. Um, it's, it's telling the story that we want to tell so that the jury understands that, that we were the people that were trying to do, do right. All right, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about settlement. Next slide, please. So obviously most, a lot of cases don't go to trial. Most cases do settle. And just to, just to talk about the old way, um, and one of the challenges I, thought, I, I saw on it was you, when you focus on summary judgment, when you get that denial of summary judgment, now what? You know, you've been, you've sort of been moving for this moment and you get a denial and now you're sort of left with a choice. Do we try to settle the case or go to trial? And um, which makes it really difficult because if you suddenly say, let's try to settle the case, um, you're set, signaling you don't want to, you, you don't really want to try the case. Not, not, not automatically so, but that's the way the plaintiff is going to read it. And with the con with the rise of these explosive jury verdicts, it's making it all the harder to settle cases anyway. So, you know, it, I can remember many, many post summary judgment mediations where the employer essentially does a cost benefit analysis. How much is it going to cost to try the case versus how, you know, versus the risk of litigation? And is there a number that approach that's under the cost of trying it that would get it done? The problem that we're seeing is that the claimed emotional distress damages in these cases often exceed the cost of trial by themselves. And I'm not suggesting that those numbers are valid. Um, but let's be clear, the numbers are absolutely made up. But the problem, there's, there's two problems. Problem one is the plaintiff is kind of grounded in them. It's a number that the plaintiff's lawyer has thrown out. Maybe it's in an answer to interrogatory. And that's the number that the, the plaintiff now thinks that that's what that my claim is worth. So that's problem one. Problem two is the plaintiff's lawyers are, because I think they're becoming savvier in pursuing these cases, they're spending a lot more time and money in the discovery process. So what they want to do is they want to get a lot more money out of a settlement than 
most employers are willing to pay because they're gonna let's let, I assume they have a an arrangement whereby they get a third of the recovery of settlement. And so the very large emotional distress damages, putting aside any lost wages, it it, it sort of makes the number artificially inflated that the, the plaintiff's lawyer is trying to achieve through a settlement. Um, and, and so it's tough. And again, I'm not suggesting cases don't settle, but one of the things that I like to do is talk about going to trial at the early stages of the case with the plaintiff's bar uh, to send a message that we're ready, willing to try this case and we're willing to see it through. And I, I'm not suggesting it's just posturing. I, my view is, you know, historically the plaintiff's bar was really good at talking about what the case will look at at trial and the employer and the defense bars often say, well, that is that assumes you survive summary judgment. And, and I, I really try, I really think it's important to flip the narrative, which is to say, you know, we want, we hope to win on summary judgment, but if not, we are ready, willing, and able to proceed to trial. And, you know, our witnesses are really, are, are, are they're focused on being vindicated. And it sends a message to the plaintiff's lawyer that, that denial of summary judgment is not going to be this sort of heart, heart crushing moment for us. It's just another stage in the discovery process. It's also really useful as a way of understanding your plaintiff's lawyer, particularly if you haven't dealt with them before. There are some plaintiff's lawyers that are very comfortable trying cases. And as probably all of you know, there are some that are just, they don't want to try cases. They're looking for a settlement. That's what they want. And sending the message early and often that we're ready to try the case and we're looking at how we're going to try it. We're, we're pursuing discovery to advance that goal, sends a message to the plaintiff's lawyer, even if you don't have to say it directly. And I do think that is critical, particularly given the plaintiff's bar is looking at these giant verdicts and thinking, we, you know, the, the risk of trial for employers is dramatically increasing. Molly, do okay. you want to do the, the code? Yes. Yes. So now um, I'm going to read out the CLE code for those who need it. It's SS, like Seifarth Shaw, 4161. SS4161. So I'm going to try to close with some practical tips in the few minutes we have left. And Molly, feel free to jump in as we go. Um, next slide, please. And then one more, please. Uh, one more. Uh, uh, actually, leave it. It's fine. Um, the, the, the next two slides kind of go together. Um, and it's really about the impact of delay. And Molly started our this presentation with the fact that, you know, we tried a case that was eight years old. Um, some of that was COVID. Some of that was just the product of when the, the plaintiff filed the case uh, relative to the end of the statute of limitations period. And some of that is just how long it takes to try a case or get a case to trial, I should say. Um, for the plaintiff, it doesn't, you know, it delays an outcome, but the plaintiff invariably, I've never met a plaintiff that doesn't know his or her case. They always remember the facts. They might not remember the details, but they remember sort of the, the gestalt of it all and they can tell that story and they have a pretty crystal, crystal clear memory of that story. Um, it's different for employers that are defending these cases because we're dependent on the people who are on the ground and working with the employee who becomes the plaintiff. And as we all know, people leave, people die, people move on to other jobs, people, um, uh, their, their view of the employer changes over time. So the people that we're dependent on may be in a very different place than where they, when, this, when it comes to trial, than where they were when the events happen. And COVID has made that a lot harder. Next slide, please. And the slide here kind of repeats some of the things that Molly already said. And I just want to take a different angle about it. You've probably all heard us talk about the importance of documenting investigations. And I, uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to have a document that is not privileged, that it, at the end of the day, a manager can look at five years, six years, seven years later, 
read it and remember, oh yeah, that's what happened. I did this and this is why I did it. Uh, and so, and I mean, oftentimes we have cases where there is no such document and that's not, that, that's not a, that's not a knock on the defendant or the employer. It's just the realities of the workplace and what happened. But I cannot stress enough for those of you who are on the front lines of doing investigations, sort of understanding that having that document, even if it's like, do we really need to go back and do it? We've already taken the step. Having something that it just lays out in a non-privileged way, what happened and why is key to helping witnesses down the road because people don't remember. Um, it's this, the, the case is really important to the defendant, but less so to each individual witness. So going back to what Molly said, that's why it's crucial they understand their role. Um, I Actually, love it. Yeah, but, and Rob, I'll say one more thing about that. And I know I keep doing a plug for part one, and I saw there was a question. There is a recording of that presentation, so if you reach out, we can we can point you to that. Um, but in that in that um, presentation, they showed some clips of mock jurors um, sort of just, you know, going through their deliberations. And one of the things that they were talking about was, you know, in the case, there was something was not documented. There was no no email, no document. And so the jurors were sort of like, well, I mean, there's just no way that that wouldn't have been documented. Like, this is a big decision. Like the fact that it's not documented, did they purposely lose it? Um, they're trying to hide something. So it kind of also just plays into this sort of conspiracy mindset that if there, if something is not documented, it's because there's something that the employer is trying to hide. So you want to do everything you can to combat that instinct. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've had many clients at the investigative stage. I have a conversation with them and kind of whatever issue they ask my advice on is kind of over. And at this point, lawyers are involved and looking at it. everything's privileged. And I come in with the, well, what if this thing goes to litigation? And I also come in with the, and what if that, that litigation then goes to trial? And so that small thing that you might not think about as requiring that non-privileged document that explains what happened could actually be a critical piece of the story. Uh, and so, even if it adds extra work, I can't stress enough about taking that step. Um, I actually like it when the plaintiff does a really thorough job of defending our witnesses. I mean, you know, typically you're preparing depositions uh, and it's all defense. You know, you're, you're telling the witness only answer the questions being asked of you and, you know, be succinct and keep your answers short and to the point. I say that all the time, but I like it when the plaintiff's lawyer asks the, well, why did you do it? What happened? And, and, and creates a record because then there's a transcript that's under oath. And so if three years later, you're calling that witness and say, hey, I need you fly to fly back to Boston because we're going to trial in a month, um, you can hand them their deposition. And then when they say, I don't remember anything, what do you need me for? You have the transcript because um, otherwise, you know, you don't have a sworn statement that you can look to unless they supplied an affidavit, which sometimes happens. Um, and so just to, to demonstrate some of the problems with if you don't have that is if you're prepping a witness with a with privileged information. So let's say the lawyer drafts a memo of an interview or the lawyer's notes and you show them, you know, there are rules of evidence that might require you to turn over that document that you use to refresh the recollection of the witness. And so the more you have documents that are not privileged, that are available, that, that the jury can see, it adds credibility to your witnesses. It, it, it counters their general suspicion that why isn't there a document? And, and it makes, frankly, your life easier at trial because you don't, have, you don't have to try to reconstruct the memory of the witness. You've got a document that they wrote and you can say, well, that's what you said. And they're not going to come in and think, yeah, I wrote that, but I didn't mean that. that that's, I, that's not going to happen. And so having that process and doing it in advance is, I think, critical to if, in, if in fact, that case that can't settle, that you don't want a summary judgment goes to trial, you're in a best, the best position to tell the jury the story you want to tell. Molly, you want to jump in or? I know we're no. I know we're close to at time. 
Yeah, we are at time. So I think um, final slide and we just want to thank you all for participating today. If you have any questions about this program, part 1, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we do have part 3 coming um, next month. That's going to be focused on preserving issues for appeal. So we hope that you'll join us for part 3 as well. Thank you.